If I asked you a question, I don't know what your answer might be, but what is it that both politicians and media lack most today? I think through all the many answers, and you're all right, uh, the answer would probably be integrity. They lack integrity. You know, they say, well, we can't trust the media. Why? Well, we can't trust the politicians. Why? Because they say stuff and then they don't do stuff and then they... Integrity. And it's not just the one guy or another guy over here. It's everybody. Everybody. It's not one news agency or another. It's everybody. From CNN to MSLSD to even Fox. All of them. They're all nuts. The only ones that don't know it are them. Integrity. How about presidents? Presidents, you um, throw all the politicians in there. It doesn't matter. Congress, Senate, mayors, governors, how many do you want? We got plenty of them. And the part the, the, the sad part about it is people who are out there screaming and protesting, he doesn't represent me. He doesn't represent me. Okay, what do you represent? What is it that you're going to stand for? Is your name unsullied? Is your name as strong with integrity that you can make such a claim as that? In other words, can you call the kettle black if you're the pot that's black? The priests came to Jesus and they were a little upset. And they got into this issue of authority. By what authority do you think you're right? What allows you to speak so definitively that we should listen and be concerned? And Jesus said, I'll tell you what, make you a deal. I love it when Jesus gets cocky because you know it's always going to go bad for the priests. He says, tell me, I'll tell you what, let me ask you a question. And if you answer that question, then I'll answer your question. John the Baptist, was his baptism true? By what authority did John baptize? Was it the Lord God? Was it true? Well, the priest sat about saying, well, if we say it was, then he's going to tell us why didn't we get baptized by John the Baptist. And if we say it wasn't, then all the people who love the John the Baptist are going to beat us up. So they were in a little bit of a quandary here. Remember, the multitude is all around, a whole bunch of people. And they came back and said, well, we don't know why John did what he did. That's a convenient answer. See, that's a political answer there. We're not sure. Well, Jesus is not going to have any of that nonsense, is He? No. He says, then I won't, I'm not going to tell you by what authority I do it. Well, that kind of shut them up a little bit. And in the moment of that silence where the priest was sitting there going... Jesus said, let me tell you a story. Oh, I love those stories. Parables. This is a piano. I'm not responsible for creating that piano. I can't play the piano. But I can certainly tell you this church has a piano. So Jesus says, let me tell you a story. A parable that points to truth. A man had two sons. And he went to the first son, the good son, and said, Son, I need you to go out there today and I need you to work in the vineyard. I know it's a hot day. 
but it's a good day and we're a little short-handed. Some of the guys didn't show up. I need you to go out and work in the vineyard. And of course, the first son, the good son, said, sure, Dad. I'll go. But then, of course, as he walked off, his cell phone rang and it was his girlfriend and she had tickets to SeaWorld or something. (laughs) So they went down to Hebrew World or whatever and he didn't go. Never mind the promise he made to his father. Never mind his own personal integrity. Now the second son, the father went to the second son who was always the snot son, the bad son. He said, son, I need you to go and work in the vineyard today. I know it's a hot day, but it's a good day and you can get a lot of work done. We're a little short-handed. And the second son said, forget it, old man. I don't want to go to the vineyard. You pay guys to go to the vineyard. I I have to do it all day for nothing. For the privilege of being your son. Forget it. I don't want to go. Keep your stupid vineyard. He walked off. No, his cell phone didn't ring. In fact, he didn't even have a cell phone. But he got to thinking about, wow, I shouldn't have probably talked to Dad that way. I mean, he's taken care of me my whole life. He's helped me get everything I've ever wanted. That dumb vineyard has given us a nice home and a place to live and food to eat. Huh? Okay, I'll go. And he goes and works in a vineyard all day. Now, we've all experienced this as parents. We know, I'm sure all those people in that day, same thing. They're going, oh, I, I cannot relate to this. But then comes the question, which son would the father laud or honor? The first one who said, I'll go because I'm your super son. Or the second son who flat out said, forget it, old man, I ain't going. But went anyway. And the Pharisees answered, it was the second son. Oh, you, there you went and stepped in it now. And Jesus looked at him and said, So I say to you, truly, the tax collectors, the sinners, the harlots, they will all enter the kingdom of God before you. Oh. The second son will enter the kingdom of God before you. Whoa. What is Jesus' point now? What is Jesus pointing at? The arrogant, snotty, insolent son. But then he goes to the vineyard. I think first and foremost, Jesus is pointing to individual personal integrity. Do y'all know what integrity is? Do you have any idea? Webster defines it as kind of a twofold sort of definition. The first part of, or the foundation of integrity, must be based on truth. If you're a liar, nobody's ever going to believe you. If you misrepresent things or misrepresent the facts, like many salespeople do, eventually people are going to find out about it after they make the purchase, and then they're going to be aggravated. Oh, I'm never going back there again. Why? Because he's a liar! He didn't tell me the stupid thing leaks. He didn't tell me it had that many miles on it. He didn't tell me. Foundational understanding of being a man or woman of integrity is you've got to tell the truth. Now you look at them two boys. Did the first one, smiling and shining, tell the truth? Well, he might have inadvertently wanted to tell the truth, but he didn't, did he? The second boy was right up front. Forget about it. Must have been from New Jersey. That's the east side of Israel. I want you to go and work in the vineyard. Forget about it. He was honest with Dad. He didn't want to go. I have no desire. I don't even care about the vineyard. 
But he did go when he got to thinking about how much Dad has cared for him all those years. And working a little bit in the vineyard would not hurt anybody. And he said, I'm going to go. In honor of the Father. Even though he didn't want to, had no desire to, and he even said he wasn't going to. He was honest with Dad when he asked. He was honest with himself later when he came to the realization that Dad has loved and cared for me my whole life. Is it so much that I give back a little bit to Him? You see, integrity starts with truth. He said what he wanted. He said what he desired. And he didn't want to go. But he was also truthful with himself. When he realized his father has given a hoot for him his whole life. Without truth, you can never have integrity. Ever. If you don't think so, try and sell somebody something and deceive them on it. And just sit back and wait till they find out. It's not going to end well. Coach Cleveland Stroud. Never heard that name because he's a young... Well, he's no, not young anymore. But he is the coach of the Rockdale County High School. Anybody know where that is? I'll give you a hint. Their mascot is a bulldog. And the boys are kind of hillbillies. Rockdale County High School, Georgia. Coach Cleveland Stroud. Who names her kid after an old city? Cleveland. Anyway, he worked for 28 years before he finally got to the state championship. 28 years, season after season, game after game. You know, basketballers, they play a bunch of games all season long. Finally got to the high school Georgia State Championship. And they were the Bulldogs. You can imagine how proud these guys were. And they played and they won one of those buzzer beater things right at the last second boom, through the net one by one point. Ah, oh, the celebration is just insane. People shouting and screaming. And when they got back to Rockville, Georgia, all the people, I mean, they had parades. Everybody lined up their pickup trucks and they drove around in a circle and Drag beer cans or something. I don't know. But it was a big celebration. Big celebration. Oh, they had dinners. They made speeches. They had bonfires and screaming, hollering, cheerleaders jumping around. It was, it was a who to do. About a month later, Cleveland Stroud, the coach, realized through just going through the records and everything, checking everything out, that one of his players was ineligible to play because he didn't live in that district where the high school was. He didn't even live in the county of Cloverdale. Now he's got a problem. That player is part of the starting lineup. That player should have never been in that game. That player is one of the best players he had. <clears throat> what do you do? Well, coach called all the boys back to school, after school, and called them all into the locker room, sat them all down on the benches. He said, gentlemen, we're being tested today. God has sent us a test. And the guys are all, you know, sitting there, they're athletes. Huh? God has sent us a test today whether we're going to be men of honesty and truth and integrity or not. And then he told them what happened. 
Well, you know the heart sank in every one of them kids. They got the banners, they got the trophies, they got the individual trophies. 28 years. Do you know how many generations of high school kids that is? They finally got a team. Finally got to the state championship and won it. And because a kid lives three blocks outside the district, what are we going to do? Well, he went and told them. The coach went and reported it, and all the team voted to do that. And, of course, they were stripped of their championship. They had to give the trophies back. Everything they thought they had gained at one was taken from them. There's no joy in Muddale that day. Coach Lyon got them all back in the locker room again. He says, you know, boys, I know you're heartbroken. I am too. I've given my whole career for this moment. It was an oversight on my part. I didn't realize it. But again, I'm going to tell you a true story. In ten years from now, nobody's going to remember the game or a score. But in a hundred years from now, people will always remember a cheater. So let's just let them forget the score and keep ourselves men and women of integrity. That's a life lesson that little coach in Cloverdale, Georgia, taught his boys amidst heartbreak. You see, integrity starts with being truthful. That's why you don't play poker in the jungle. You know why? There's too many cheetahs. Yeah, I I knew that was going to (laughs) be. That has nothing to do with this sermon whatsoever. (laughs) Just seeing if y'all listening. Integrity starts with being truthful. The first son was not truthful. The second son was probably too truthful. But it's also, if you're going to speak the truth, then what do you got to do? You got to do the truth, right? And you got to do it completely, not half heartedly, not just enough to get by. You're not a government worker. Do the whole job and do it as if you were doing it for yourself. Integrity is a two step development, according to Mr. Webster. First, you've got to be based, founded, and defined in truth. Second of all, you've got to do what you say. And see, that's another problem most of our people in this fine country have these days. They'll say anything to get anything, but end up not doing it. Y'all know who C.S. Lewis is? Do you really know who he is? I bet you don't. Do you know that he was a soldier? He served in World War I. And he and his buddy that went through training together and everything, they got to be best of buds, better, stronger than brothers, as he puts it. And they each promised one another. C.S. Lewis was a single man, but his buddy was newly married, young wife, and a brand new daughter. So they each promised each other that, you know, if, if he got killed, that C.S. Lewis would take care of the wife and child. And if C.S. Lewis got killed, that he would take care of his mom. And that was the deal. Well, they fought all the way through World War I. And C.S. Lewis was discharged a, a, a little bit early. And his buddy had to continue on a couple more battles. Anyway, long story short, he ends up getting killed. One of the last battles of the war. He ends up getting killed. So C.S. Lewis was in his prayer time one day when he realized the promise he had made to his war friend. 
So he went to and met the young wife and the child who was, as you might imagine, very distraught. And C.S. Lewis told them not to worry that he would work hard and would send them uh, money and anything they needed uh, until they could be on their own. Well, this is the part of C.S. Lewis you don't know. The wife and the child grew up to be cynical, arrogant, self, selfish, self-serving, spending every dime and demanding more their whole life. They turned into real snots. C.S. Lewis provided for them everything anyway. It would have been so easy for him to walk away and say, forget you two. Years have passed and he kept giving and kept giving and kept giving literally to the day he died when he willed them each a bit of his own fortune. Even though they were two of the nastiest women God ever put on this earth or grew to be. But C.S. Lewis writes in his personal journal, regardless of what they've turned into, that doesn't relieve me from the promise I made to my friend before, before God. Who would do that? Who would do that? I'll tell you who. See, the second boy said, I don't want to. He was true to his word. Then he was true to his father. And realizing that, he said, I will make that sacrifice. I will be a man of integrity. That's what integrity is. Speak the truth. Do it. Somehow along the line, we forget that. Or we get to that do it part. And it just gets to be too much trouble. Integrity is not that hard. Say it and do it. See, a lot of people say, say it and mean it. Well, that means nothing. Oh, I meant it when I said it. But you didn't do it. Say it and do it. Those are the key elements of integrity. And if you say it and do it every time, say it and do it every time when you're young, when you're middle-aged, when you're old, people are going to get to the point where they say, are you any relation to Grover Gaither? Yeah, he's my grandfather. Most honest man I ever knew in my life. Worked a hard day for a good day's wage. He worked all day long. I never saw him sitting down, taking a break, smoking a cigarette. He worked all day, sweat all day for an honest wage. And he did it for 63 years. Best man I ever had taking care of my farms. Two generations later, I'm going to sell you that property. Not on anything you've done or anything you've said. What I'm going to do is I'm going to honor the man that was true to me. I'm going to honor that man. I don't want to sell that land, but I'm going to sell it to you. I don't want to work in that vineyard, Dad, but I'll go and work in that vineyard. What do most politicians, media lack today? Integrity. How do you build that back? Well, it's not easy at this point. You've got to be truthful and then you've got to do. Not mean. You've got to do what you said. 